Father, how true our hearts cry out, come rest on us. We know you're in this room. We know you're moving. We're asking you to fill us again and again and again and again. Father, we thank you that you will make us bold, that you will make us people that will preach your gospel with strength, with power, with truth, with fire, with life. Father, we thank you. You will loose us into signs and wonders and miracles. We will each be walking tabernacles where people can walk in and see the presence of God because we carry you. We carry you with honor. We carry you with dignity because we love you. We just thank you for this opportunity and we bless you in Jesus' name. You may be seated, ladies. Thank you, worship team. You're awesome. We looked last evening that the first reason that God was crying out and demanding, let my people go, was that they could celebrate him. They could worship him. And the pilgrim feasts were filled with dancing. They were filled with just the expression of how much love and how much gratitude there was for God. And so this morning, we're going to switch a little bit. Last night, we looked at what the worship did on earth, what the worship did for people, how the worship changed things. But I, I want to switch it this morning because, you see, I, didn't, I had so many places that I could go. And it was like the Holy Spirit just, he just centered me on this one thing. And we're going to look at worship as a weapon of war. And this first story, we may not get past this first story. Who knows? We'll just see where we go. But 2 Kings, third chapter, ninth verse. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they marched a compass of seven days, and there was no water for the host or for the cattle that followed them. I want you to look at this weird pairing. There are three kings. There is the king of Israel, who was probably one of the most wicked men around. There was the king of Edom, who was a heathen nation, worshiping all kinds of gods, just like the king of Israel did. And then in the middle of that was Jehoshaphat. Now, sometimes we have allegiances, and Jehoshaphat had a legion with Ahab. And it got him in a horrible mess. And he went to war with these two kings. Now, we don't understand that sometimes our choices put us in positions where we are in a compromised state. And we don't understand why suddenly we're in a desert place. But Jehoshaphat was out there now, and he was in a desert place, and they couldn't find water. And of course, because armies of that day didn't have the things that armies of today had, their food supply walked with them. So now there's no water for the food supply. And I want you to hear just where the Holy Spirit took me inside. Some aspects of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have made allegiances where we shouldn't make allegiances. And we've been walking through a desert land. Come on. And all of a sudden, we feel like there isn't even an unction of life-preserving power, and our food supply is affected. 
And so the king of Israel could never take responsibility for himself. He could never take responsibility for his problems. And so look at verse 10. And the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver us into the hand of Moab. The church sometimes collectively get into a situation where we make allegiances we shouldn't make. And there are ramifications for those choices. But because we can't accept responsibility for ourselves, we blame God for where we are. And this man was a Baal worshiper. And it's very interesting to me that he didn't say Baal brought us out. Come on. He worshiped Astrith. I don't see him saying, Astrith led us out here. But in the middle of a crisis, he blamed the Lord God of heaven and earth. And I want you to follow where the Holy Spirit took me. We get ourselves into these places where there are allegiances we shouldn't have. And we don't look at the things that brought us there. We don't look at the kingdom of hell that put us in a position where God lifted his good hand. So we get into these situations and we now turn back to the God of heaven and earth and say, you did it. But this man who was known to hate anything about God, they get there and he said, I know what's going on here. The God of heaven is selling us into the hand of Moab. And there is a component here. No matter how far, no matter how many allegiances, no matter how many things happen, the bottom line inside every human being is there is a God in heaven. And we may blame him instead of beg him or repent or turn, but everybody, I don't care who they are, when the going gets tough, what do they do? They're asking for the God of heaven to intervene. Now, Jehoshaphat is in this mixed company. And I want you to read verse 11, because all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat's spiritual button clicked on. And I am so excited because this is what I'm telling you. As this new era is opening like I've never seen it open, it's just crazy. All of a sudden, the church is flipping the spiritual button. All of a sudden. Come on. That song is so true. Dry bones are rattling. And it's like the church is switching on the button, and it's like, how in the world did we get here? How did we get in this dangerous spot? How, how did we get so lukewarm? How did we get so cold? How did we get such divided attentions? And the buttons are flipping on. And Jehoshaphat's button flipped on. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord, that we might inquire of the Lord by him. And one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphath, that poured water on the hands of Elijah. I want you to look at three key things. That's why I don't know, because so many things are, are boiling inside of me. I've got, so, I've got several places to go. I just don't know if we're going to get there. But his, his button flipped on. Now, you'll notice that the king of Israel, who blamed God for their situation, had no clue. You see, all God was to him was responsible for the problem, not an answer to the problem. But here is a servant of that king, and this servant has been in his presence 
but has had his mouth sealed because he was afraid of the ramifications if he let the king know he knew anything about the true God. And what I feel inside the church is as this new era has already begun and the doors are beginning to open, not only is the church switching the flip, the flipping the spiritual uh, button, but listen to me, the church is now saying, I got to open my mouth. I got to come out of hiding. And whatever that means and whatever the ramifications for that are, I've got to come out of hiding. And God's putting us in places where he's saying to us, you've got to speak up. And sometimes we feel crazy. No, really, I'm serious. I had a situation recently where I had to tell the administrative assistant of our town supervisor, I had a dream, and I'm calling you because of a dream. Woman said to me, you had a what? (laughs) But there are moments in time when God is saying to us, open up your mouth. Reason is because people are so hungry for something more than they have. And so the the king's servant goes, listen, I happen to know where Elisha is. Now, it's very interesting to me that he didn't say, the prophet Elisha is here, and he parted the Jordan River, come on, and walked across it. He didn't say, Elisha is here, and he healed the water supply in this town of Jericho. He didn't say any of those things. Elisha's spiritual reputation was he was faithful. He didn't get credit for all the great things he had done. His reputation with this man, the thing that grabbed a hold of this man's heart was that he had faithfully served Elisha. And in this day, our reputation is how we live. More than any other time, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you must live in such a way so that it's your integrity people know, not what you do. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. When Jehoshaphat was reminded of Elisha's integrity and his reputation of service, the Spirit of God inside of him clicked over and said, the word of the Lord is with him. In this day, not only are dry bones rattling, not only is the Holy Spirit resting on us, but hear me, the word of the Lord is going to start pouring through the church. Not figures out there, but pouring through us as believers. We're going to be known as people who have the word of the Lord. And the way we get that word of the Lord is our service to God in our private times, our worship to God in our private times, the way we pray in the Spirit in our private times. It's easier to pray in a corporate setting, come on, in the Spirit when you've been praying at home. Because you know what? It doesn't feel awkward. It doesn't feel strange. It doesn't feel put on. You just slip into comfortable house shoes and it just flows out. And so these three kings, Jehoshaphat now takes the lead. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, No, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. I want you to focus with me. 
Here is a man who called the war himself because somebody made him mad. Come on. And he got two buddies to go with him. He has no relationship with God whatsoever, and the prophet Elisha calls him out on that. And what does he say? He argues, no, my prophets won't help me. Come on, because it's your God that put me in this place. There is a reality in this day. Our choices, come on, have gotten us here. But the gods of the world have no answer for us. Our choices are putting us in these places. But there's nothing to go to in the world that can get us out. But I love Elisha. He looked at him and he said, I, I, why would I even talk to you? Who are you to me? Go back to your own method. And then he said, if it wasn't for the king of Israel, I mean the king of Judah, I wouldn't even talk to you. And what happens is he looks at him and he said, I don't, I don't exalt you, is what the word means. I don't pay attention to you. But because I regard the king of Judah, I will do it. Now, these next, this next verse is the most powerful, packed verse ever. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I wouldn't look toward you. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came on him. Our worship is a weapon that changes environments and goes to war against the demonic presences in the atmosphere. And Elisha looks at this mess, and he said, I've got the king of Israel who worships Baal and Ashtoreth and is a horrible man. I have the king of Edom who's a heathen and doesn't have any idea where anything is. And the atmosphere was static because of the presence of so much demonic activity. Come on. And we in the body of Christ are living in a season where there is so much static. And we walk into places. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever had this experience, but you walk into a place and it's like, this place is very noisy. And pretty soon you're, you're agitated on the inside. And the only thing you can think of is, I think I'm leaving. Come on. And we don't realize what has just happened to us is we have discerned the spiritual activity in the area we're in. And Elisha looked at that, and he knew that in that static environment, it was going to be hard to press through and get a true word from God. Come on. And he said, the only way I'm going to press through is if you give me a minstrel. Now, the word here for minstrel means to sing and play songs to the glory of God. And Elisha looked at it and he went, the only way I'm going to break through the static is worship. Church, our worship is a weapon of war to cleanse the atmosphere around us so we can get a clear word from God. And as the minstrel played, the hand of God came on him. Now, I want you 
to see the situation. They're thirsty, they're tired, they're in a dangerous position, they're scared to death, they've got cattle starting to die because there's no water. And they have put their trust in one man to hear the voice of God. The world is dying for the church to stand up, shake off the static, tune into the living God, and get a word. And the worship that we do brings that into reality. You know, we, we need to be people that keep our environment saturated with worship. In our cars, we need to be listening to worship music, however you do that. We need to saturate ourselves so that when we walk out of our car into a business, people know somebody just walked through the room that was different. Our associate pastor traveled a lot when she was young. And she traveled to France. And she lived in France a while. And she said to me, you know, they don't bathe. And she said, so you get in these compact buses and, and like subway car things. And she said, it stinks. But she said, the strangest thing was when I got on a subway car or I got into one of the buses, everybody there went <laughs> <laughs> And she said, they were smelling my shower gel. They were sm and she said they were going <laughs> <laughs> And as I was reading this passage of Scripture, God reminded me of that story. And he said, when you get out of the presence of God and you walk into a place, you smell different. There's something you carry that's different. As this conversation with the town soup's administrative assistant went on, she asked me a question. And my answer was truly, I don't know. And she said, I know, you just had a dream. <laughs> and she asked me a question, another question, and I really didn't know. And I said, I, I don't know. And she said, I know, you just had a dream. When we do things like that, come on. We don't think they're listening, but listen to me, they're listening. And I think from the result of the conversation, she must have told the soup this crazy lady called and had a dream. Because I asked for one opportunity, and out of that I got five. Now, the situation is this. When the world is confronted by the church, come on, and there is a desperacy like there is in our township over COVID. They just want somebody that's got a positive answer. That's all they want. And if it's wrapped up in a dream, they'll take it. They don't care. They just need answers. Come on. And the good hand of the Lord fell on him. And he began to prophesy. Now, I don't know if, if you are as aware of it as I am, but God is never logical. <laughs> Have you noticed that? So God has this whole plan. Now, this army has been marching in the desert for seven days without water. And God's plan is, send your men out now to dig ditches. Come on. That's not logical. They're tired. They're hot. They don't have water. Expending energy is not what they want to do or should be doing, but the Lord's answer was dig ditches. And 
And the Lord said, you're not going to see any water. There's not going to be any rain. There's not going to be any logical reason. But the ditches are going to fill with water. What God is doing inside us as believers is he's getting us to step out where there is no logic. Come on. And he doesn't necessarily send an outward confirming sign. Come on, the church has lived for a long time hunting confirmations of everything. And God was explicit here. Listen, ladies, there's some times when there is no confirmation. There's just the word of the Lord. They dug the ditches. And have you ever noticed God doesn't wear a wristwatch? So the ditches are dug, right? Nothing. And I can imagine the guys who dug the ditches were saying, I knew this was crazy. I knew this was the craziest thing we ever did. I know why were we listening to this lunatic who doesn't worship Baal, who doesn't worship Astroth, who only worships the living God. Why were we listening to him? And God waited till the next morning. And all of a sudden, water came from Edom. And they got the victory they needed because the sun shone on the water and God made Moab think that it was blood and that they had killed each other and they came down unarmed for the spoil. What happens to us is as we cooperate with the power of God, there are so many times we don't have to fight the battle. He does it for us. Just so that we know that we were not necessary. Come on. Come on. We think that we are so necessary. So let's look at what the weapon of worship did. First thing, worship worship overrode the power of deception. Years ago, I was fussing at God, and and I was was saying to him, listen, I, I don't know, but if you'd kill the false prophets and the false teachers, your people wouldn't be deceived. And if you just didn't let them have all the money in the world, nobody'd listen to them. And I was fussing. And I got sick. And all I could do was read the word. And I got to Jeremiah, the 14th chapter. And Jeremiah said, God, this is your fault. If you would kill the false teachers and the false prophets, your people wouldn't be deceived. I said, see, we've been telling you that for (laughs) generations. Do you listen? No. And very sweetly, he said, shut up. (laughs) And keep reading. And when you read that passage in the Amplified, it is a shakable thing. It shakes you to the core of your being. Because this is what God said. I am going to kill the false prophet. And I am going to kill the false teachers, but I'm going to kill the people too. Listen, you cannot be deceived except by your own consent. And God has gone after that deception that is resting in the church on us as individuals. He's gone to war against that. And the way it breaks is in worship. Next thing is worship cut through the atmosphere of despair and desperate need. Those three kings were panicky when they walked in there. Worship overrode the presence of the most sinful king and overrode the presence of a 
heathen king and brought in an atmosphere where the presence of the living God could move, could walk, could speak, could saturate. Our worship is such a weapon in the hand of God that it goes to war against the satanic things that are in the atmosphere. It goes to war against the presence of people that are in our midst that are taking down our faith level. Come on. Our worship is the most powerful weapon in the hand of God to clear the atmosphere around us. Worship cut through the atmosphere of doubt and false image of God and loosed true prophecy. Worship allowed the release of God's battle plan. If there is anything that we need as individuals right now is we need God's battle plan for us. We need God's battle plan for where we live. We need God's battle plan for where we work. We need God's battle plan for our churches. We need God's battle plan for our ministries. We've got to have God's battle plan in this day. And God's battle plan in this day will be tailor-made for you, for the enemy around you, for the situation around you, for your need. You can't pick up somebody else's battle plan in this era that worked for them. He's breaking the mold and he's saying, get a fresh word for my presence. Now, turn with me to Numbers 21. We are going to get this far. I have not seen a card, so we're okay. Numbers 21. These are two little verses. We sing a song about them, but I don't know how much time we spend living in them. Verses 17 and 18. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. And then the princes digged the wells, and the nobles of the people digged it by the direction of the lawgiver with their stays, and from the wilderness they went to Matanah. Now, I want you to see what happens. This mixed multitude begins to sing, and we're going to look at these words. And God put the leaders of the people, and he put them in a place where he said, take your stay and begin to beat it into the dry, dusty ground. Just keep banging it into the dry, dusty ground. We have a season in this new era where the ground has been dry and the ground is so dusty that we have got to start getting out our stays. We've got to start going into the ground. We've got to start prophetically shouting out, spring up, oh well. And Israel, the word tells us that the river of God followed them through the wilderness. So what this verse is talking about is God was saying, let a cry come out of the people, that river that's following us. We need the river that's following us. That's why there's so many songs out right now about the Holy Spirit, rest on us. There's there's just songs everywhere about the power of the Holy Spirit because there's a cry coming out of the church saying, we need that well that's from the water that follows us. And they began to beat the ground. And the word song here is the word that means a song of a Levitical choir a religious song. 
They were not singing, Spring Up, O oh Well, because it was a popular song of that day. They were singing, Spring Up, O oh Well, because out of their spirit man, there was a cry like there is inside the church today. And we're saying, come on, Holy Spirit, come down and rest on us. We know you're in this room. We know you're going to fill us. We're, we're, we're looking for that encounter with the Holy Spirit. We're looking for it corporately. We're looking for it individually. There is a massive cry inside the church and the church as individuals and corporately. We're looking around going, we don't know how we got in this desert, but we know the Holy Spirit is here somewhere. And the word sing there means to sing loudly a testimony. Now, what were they doing? They were testifying, and they were saying, oh, listen, that river that follows us, it's here. We may have, not, we may have wandered away from it. We may not have been strongly attached to it, but we know that river is here. And they began to sing a testimony. I know you're here, spring up. I know you're here, spring up. I know you're here, spring up. And the leaders began to take their stays and began to break the crust. And this is a season in this new era when we need to start breaking the crust not around ourselves, around our friends, around our families. There needs to be a cry. We've got to have a Holy Spirit move again. And they began to sing a prophetic word and worship here loosed signs and wonders that changed natural elements. There is something about worship when we are worshiping that not only do we move the heart of God, but we move the hand of God. We move the creative hand of God. He's looking at us, and when he hears that cry come out of us that's loud and that testimony that says, I know the Holy Spirit's real. I know he's here somewhere. I know he's going to fill me. I know he's in the room then what begins to happen is that testimony that comes out of our mouths begins to change natural elements. And the element it changes first is us. And when they break down the human body, we have the components of this earth because we were formed from earth. Come on. And the components are here. So when I see those, those songs and I see those verses that talk about the power of God on earth, I keep saying, God, I'm earth. That's what I need. I need you to spring up out of this casing of earth. And I need you to flow with power, with supernatural power. God is loosening inside the minds of believers, the understanding we are supernatural beings housed in a natural casing and God's going to get the supernatural out of us. There's an old book. It was popular many, many years ago. I thought it was out of print. Somebody had given me a copy of it many, many years ago, and I truly thought the book was out of print. But you know what I found out? It's not out of print, and there's a place to get it. And the book is called Prison to Praise. It's an old book. But its truths are for now. You see, things are cyclical in God. And as people get desperate and there's a cry, God resurrects something that was in another season when people were desperate and there was a cry. And we begin to learn. We're not saying, oh, God, I praise you that my cat died. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, God, I praise you that even though my cat died, come on, you have something for me in this situation. 
You have something I'm going to come out of in this situation with more strength, with more understanding, with more whatever. We're not saying, thank you, God, praise you, my cat died. It's praise you that out of that situation, fruit is going to come. And the whole book, Prison to Praise, is about developing that understanding that our praise is such a weapon in the hand of God. The first natural thing it changes in the environment is us. It changes our attitude. It changes our outlook. It changes our thought process. It changes our direction. It changes our purpose. It changes our attitudes so incredibly. And then when we're changed and we rub up against somebody, come on, and we live in front of that person, in that way, people change. Come on. And we don't, our lives speak volumes. How do we get through hard times? How do we get through desperate times? How does God hold us together and then give us the ability to hold people around us together comes from the power of the worship and praise that pours out of us in his presence in those broken times. And all of a sudden, we're changed, our attitudes change, God gives us a battle plan, and we move out. And what the enemy meant for evil turns around to be the very thing that destroys part of his kingdom. I want you to continue with me because I still haven't seen the sign. So give me 2 Chronicles 20. I'm good? Okay. 2 Chronicles 20. Again, Jehoshaphat's in a mess. But this time, He's in his own mess. Come on. And he could tap in and begin to expect. He went before the Lord. He did the things he knew to do. And all of a sudden, a prophetic word came. Now, I'm about to say something to you. You may like it. You may not like it. I'm sorry. It is about time we started hunting God's voice for us. Come on. We cannot follow voices here and voices there and voices anywhere else. God is calling us to get to the point where we are so desperate, we are on our face saying, God, what are you saying to me? What is my place? What is my battle plan? What am I supposed to do? And what I'm supposed to do is not what anybody else is supposed to do. Come on. And God begins to tailor make things. But because we have not been trained to hear the voice of God, come on. We've been trained to hunt a prophetic voice. Come on. Come on. It's very hard for us when we're in trouble to connect with the voice of God. And Jehoshaphat sets an an environment, and the prophetic word comes. And look at verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed what? Singers. You're, you're, you're going to war, and you point singers? to the Lord and that should give praise about the beauty of God's holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever.
He sent out singers. Because what had the word from God been? The word from God had been, the battle's not yours, the battle's mine. Now, sometimes we're on the front line and we're battling in hand-to-hand combat. Come on, that's just the way it is. Sometimes that's the way it is. But sometimes God says, I got this. Just praise me. Just send out the praisers. And I love what the praisers did. The praisers didn't concentrate on anything but God's holiness. They didn't concentrate on anything. But the mercy of God endureth forever. They concentrated on who God was, not who they were, not who God was in them, not on the situation. They just focused on who God was. We as individuals have got to rein ourselves in, and there are moments in time what we're saying is, God, I praise you because you're merciful. I praise you because your mercies endure forever. I praise you because you're holy. Sometimes the situations we are in are so struggling and so hard and so pressed that if we can just focus on his identity, come on, we've, we have eliminated, we've eliminated, the power that the enemy has over our minds. I want you to think about Gideon. And the Bible tells us that when he went to war, before he went, God changed his name. And God let him know, I am Jehovah Shalom. Now, when you look at the beginning part of that particular chapter, you find out Israel was afraid of the enemy. They were living in caves and dens. They weren't even trying to harvest their harvest because they were terrified of the enemy. And God said, my name is Jehovah Shalom because the peace of God defeats fear. And what God wants us to focus on in this season, because the world is crazy. I'm sorry, but the world is crazy. If you drive on Long Island, just pull out of your driveway and you will realize the world is crazy. <laughs> just wait a half a second after the light turns green. Yeah. God is saying to us, get your eyes off the thoughts that are bombarding your brain. Come on. The enemy always tells you things are terrible, horrible, and awful. The enemy always tells you what to be afraid of. Come on. That's what he does because when he can capture us, when he can paralyze us in fear, he doesn't have to worry about us. You do not understand the devil is so afraid of you that you will kick into who you are, who God is inside of you. You will kick into the power of praise. You'll kick into the power of worship. He's terrified because he knows his kingdom And so he produces fear. And the only way we can get around that fear, I don't care how strange it seems, is that all of a sudden we're just saying, God, you're wonderful, you're powerful, you're incredible. There's no problem too big for you. There's no situation too difficult for you. There's nothing you can't move. Isn't that one of the songs we say? Come on. There's nothing you can't do. And we need to start focusing our minds on there's nothing that you can't do. Now, I want you, it's so crazy. And they went out. And it said what? 
they stood up to praise with a loud voice. We can be loud everywhere else but in church. Come on. I don't know about here. I just know a New Yorker can yell at you about the weather. <laughs> we can be loud everywhere. But we come into church and all of a sudden, we become very demure. Come on. We can have been out in the, in the lobby drinking coffee, laughing and carrying on, walk through those doors in it. But it said, the priest stood up and they praised with a loud voice. God wants the church loud and rowdy and showing off his glory. And they rose early in the morning. And this is what Jehoshaphat said. Believe the prophets and you'll prosper. Now, this is what I want you to hear me say to you. When God tells you to do something, believe the voice of God and you'll prosper. Come on. We have to be willing to do things that we don't have answers for. When I got five permissions, I was so excited, and then I said, okay, God, now how do we do it? Come on. Come on. We've got to be people who will say, I'm loud and I'm rowdy and I'm expecting you to take the next step. You yeah. gave me the word, you're going to give me the next step. And God is building the confidence in the church that he's alive, he is well, and when he tells you to do something, he's going to take you through it. He's going to provide everything you need to do it, and the whole thing is going to be for the glory of the kingdom of God. And they sang those sing, the praises. And what happened? The Lord sent ambushments. Now, how cool is that? They're praising. I don't know if I had been one of the priests that was out there as praisers and the army was behind me. I don't know if I'd have been so thrilled that I was the one out first. But what I love about them is they were in a dangerous place. They were leading the army. They were announcing to the enemy, we're over here. And they were singing with a loud voice. And they were saying, not just in an environment like this, not just an environment in your home, not just in an environment in your car, but they were in a battle in the real world. And they said, we don't know anything else to do but sing at the top of our lungs. And they went out. And they were singing praises. And God said, okay. And he began to send ambushments. And what do we know those ambushments were? They weren't military angels that were suddenly appearing on the battlefield with weapons and killing the army in front of them. That's not what was happening. The ambushments were in the people's brains. Come on. And it turned one nation against another nation. And they began to fight each other. And by the time Israel got there, there wasn't one man alive. Because the ambushments that God sent moved on their brains. Come on. And there's a verse in the Bible, people that know me, know I take it very literally. I pray it 
all the time. When the situation warrants it, they know they're going to get a prayer that involves this verse. Beca reason is not just from this story, but from several other places. God made it real to me. Are you ready? God turns the heart of kings like a water course. And there, I believe that. I believe it strongly. And I believe that when I pray for that, that's what he does. All of a sudden, the heart of a king. And the heart of a king is anybody that is in authority over you. And God, we begin to pray it. God, turn the heart of the king. God, cause him to see your way. God, cause him to see your heart. God, cause him to see the things that need to be done in the situation. And I cannot tell you, time after time after time after time, people that don't know God, but were standing as a block to somebody in the kingdom of God that needed to get something done, the heart turns. And we've got to realize our God is not just God in this room. Oh, come on, ladies. God is not just God in this room. He's not just God in your home. He's not just God in your car. He is God in every place. He saturates every inch of this earth. They don't like it. They don't want to acknowledge it. But he is in sovereign control. There are things happening around the world that tell us how real the Bible is. The Bible talks to us about the last days and said if the days had not been shortened, the it was shortened for the very elect's sake. And I, I read a lot of scientific stuff that, that comes into my hands. It's just something I happen to enjoy doing. And there, do you remember several months ago and it was a lot of months ago now, when there was that recent um, radioactive spill in Russia, it was off the shore. Do you remember that? Well, it was so bad that Russia had to let scientists in. And they came in, and they started doing experiments around there, trying to see what they could do. And it wasn't that far from Chernobyl. And they went to Char Chernobyl, and what they found was there is a molten sea of radioactivity in that area. And the crust of the earth there is starting to thin. And they can't tell whether it's going to be a volcano that's going to spray radioactivity for miles, or if it's going to be a lava, lava river of radioactivity and it's going to go down into your... They don't know what it's doing. But they were able to put some instruments down because the crust of the earth is thinning. And this was their result. The earth is spinning faster on her axis than she ever has. And that made them start looking at the whole solar system. And they're saying that the whole solar system is moving faster than it ever has. The end of this article, science are now saying we no longer have a 365-day year. We're down to 340-something. Because the Earth is spinning so much faster. Now listen to me. God is sovereign. He said the days were going to be shortened, didn't he? They don't like it. They don't like to think he's sovereign. But ladies, he is sovereign. And the earth is starting to spin faster. And we're losing days because we're spinning faster. And so the issue for us is how much do we believe he's sovereign? Come on. How much do we believe he's in control? How much do we believe that when we praise, when we worship, 
When we pray the word back, things change. If you don't hear anything I say to you all weekend long, I want you to hear my heart saying to you, this is a season where praise and worship moves the hand of God. It is a season of praise and worship where warfare is accomplished and what we're doing is we're just loving him. We're just praising him. We're just adoring him. We're dancing. We're moving. We're, we're feasting in his presence. And he steps in because he is sovereign. And he is in control. And he hasn't, he didn't go out for coffee <laughs> at Dunkin' Donuts. He's not eating a donut, drinking his coffee and come back and look down and say, oh, <laughs> hmm, now how did that happen? <laughs> I was just gone 20 minutes. <laughs> He's constantly working. He's constantly breaking through barriers. Come on. He's constantly transforming the way we think. Come on, ladies. For one purpose and one purpose only, that we become a living, breathing organism that is saturated with the supernatural power of God, that is saturated with expectancy, that is saturated with hope, that is saturated with the knowledge that our God reigns. And I don't know if Josh is any ways near the sound of my voice. Josh, are you? He's probably putting that together. You hear him? Josh. Thank you. <laughs> you see, I want us to sing that song again. God gave me that song in my spirit and said it was for this conference. Come on. Because we've got to start saying to him, I know you are in this room. You make my heart pound. People, the whole presence of the Holy Spirit in this new era and the part of it we're in, he's very palpable. And I just want us to close this session out with that song, I want to turn it to Josh. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates and.
heaven on day come rest on us come rest on us so come down spirit when you move you make my heart down. when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me come down spirit when you move you make my heart down. when you fill the room you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Oh, oh, no, you will fill us, Lord. Oh, so Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we you're all we want, singing, Holy Spirit, come rest on us, all we want, yes you are, you're all we want, we're singing, Holy Spirit, rest on us, you're all we From your heart to heaven, you're all we want. You're all we want, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit. To the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come, spirit, when you move, you make my heart. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart. When you fill the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know feel us. Oh, yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. It's your desire. It's your desire. Oh, so come down. So come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me, come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart down. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come. 